Hey, hey there, chemistry team. It's your chemistry coach coming at you with a brand new chapter and topic. So this is video number one. And for our particular class, this will be chapter 18. It's going to cover, again, this is falling under that big umbrella of equilibrium. We've looked at weak acids, weak bases, water, autoionization, complex ions. Oh, so many. So we're going to add solids to this, specifically slightly soluble solids. This does not apply to soluble solids, so like sodium chloride. They just dissolve to 100%. Treat them like strong electrolytes. They're good to go. There's no equilibrium that forms. Um, and we would have called these an introductory chemistry and uh, first semester general chemistry insoluble solids. So we just pretended they don't dissolve at all. But on a molecular or atomic scale, so all solids dissolve or dissociate a small extent. Water's going to come in and pull out some cations and anions. Maybe not a lot, depending on how high those charges are, right? How small those ions are, how electrostatically attracted they are. So, you know, using Coulomb's law, obviously you can look at the ionic forces. The stronger those ions are held together, the harder it is for water molecules to pull them out into solution and surround them with that sphere of water molecules like we showed in prior videos. But it happens to all of them to some extent. And uh, this is where equilibrium occurs. So for these slightly soluble solids, an equilibrium will occur. So let's say we take, you know, some uh, deionized water. Now, it doesn't matter how much, but typically we're going to measure this effect quantitatively, the solubility of a solid, how much it dissolves. We'll typically do that for one liter of deionized water. That's where the solubility comes in. We'll be able to calculate these things in this chapter using equilibrium, right? Because we can figure out the equilibrium concentrations. For example, let's say we have some calcium oxalate, right? I finally had somebody find the error I made in a prior video. I think it was the common effect one. And I gave, I, I, I'm, I'm good to my word, I gave my three points extra credit for the first person. Um, when I introduced the common ion effect, I did for weak acids, weak base, and solids. And I did, I think it was calcium oxalate, but I gave it a two minus charge. Solids are neutral. <laughs> it can't have a minus two charge. The oxalate has a minus two charge, the oxalate ion, but the solid calcium oxalate is neutral because the calcium is a plus two, the oxalate is a minus two, and they cancel each other out electrostatically. So kudos to you. I can't say your name on the video, but you've got your three points. You know who you are. Good job. <laughs> Some of you were scouring for that error. A little minor error, but still, I was like, ah, leave it in there. Like a little Easter egg. And Easter's tomorrow, so I left a little Easter egg in there for you. Let's take a look. Let's say we got some calcium oxalate. We plop it in a liter of water. All right? So what's going to happen? Those water molecules are going to come in and start being you know, attracted to it. So the, the partially negative oxygen is attracted to the cations. The partially positive hydrogens in the water is attracted to the anions. And what's going to happen is they're going to get pulled out of solution, right? So you're going to get the calcium ions, some of them, pulled out into solution surrounded by water molecules. You're also going to get the oxalate ions. They're going to go into solution as well. So you're going to have both of these ions zipping around in solution. And the more those ions form in solution, let's say we started with all solid, it'll start dissolving a little bit and dissociating. But as you form more and more of those cations and anions in solution, they're moving around. You know, not too many people to play with, but as more people come to the party, oh, there's a better chance you got somebody to dance with, right? Okay, so sooner or later, they're going to find each other and go, hey, boop, you're positive, I'm negative. You're really positive, positive two, I'm a negative two, plus one, minus one, not so much, right? They're really looking for a plus three. That'd be even better. But boom, they can recombine and head back. So what will happen? Let's draw it like this. These ions will come out of solution. They can recombine and go back to form the solid. And sooner or later, you will form an equilibrium where the rate of dissolving, right? So this is your equilibrium. So the dissolving rate... will equal the formation of the precipitation rate. That's our equilibrium. So when the rate of the ions forming from the solid, dissociating from the solid, equals the rate of them recombining and coming back and resolidifying, now we've got equilibrium. At that point, the ion concentrations are constant. And we can throw ice tables at this, and we can measure a whole bunch of cool stuff. 
Of course, we can set up equations for that, right? That's pretty straightforward. And, uh, you know, get the KSP and all that. Uh, so let's do it, right? So if I've got the calcium oxalate solid, that will form an equilibrium between the calcium ion. And there's a, there's a subscript of one here on the calcium. So you put a coefficient of one there. Whatever the subscript is, time, you know, let's take the subscript, put it over there. That's the number of ions you get. And then we'll get the oxalate ion. So this is the equation, equilibrium equation, representing that process. And of course, we could do the KSP for that, right? Let me make some room. We'll squish this on here. And you'll see why we have room for this, because we're not going to have a denominator, baby, because it's a solid, right? All of our reactants are solids. They don't go in the denominator. They're considered to be constant. So these ice tables, to me, hopefully to you, you'll see soon, these ice tables are easier than weak acids, weak bases, complex ions. These are the easiest of them all. Pretty cool. So this is going to be the concentration of the cations concentration. In this case, raised to the power of 1 times the concentration of the anion, also raised to the power of 1. And we don't put the solid in the denominator, right? Solids and liquids we don't include. Nice! That's it! That's your KSP! And we can look that up in a table, right? So let's go look this baby up and squish this value down here. So this is calcium oxalate. So you're going to want this KSP table, a really squishy one, right? So here's your KSP table for the solid going into the cations and anions. And just go in alphabetical order. Look for calcium. Hopefully it's on here. Here's the calcium compounds. Calcium, 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 calcium oxalate right there. So I see calcium oxalate. There's the formula. 4 times 10 to the minus 9. Now look how small these are. 10 to the minus 28, 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 44. Oh my god, those are so tiny. Oh man. So this one's 4 times 10 to the 9. Which means that's really tiny, which means it's mostly going to be the solid. Mostly. Very few ions in solution. Very, very reactant dominate because all of those numbers are very tiny. That's why we considered them insoluble last semester in an intro chem. Uh, now we consider them slightly soluble. But down 10 to the minus 40th, holy moly, there's hardly any ions at all in solution. Woo! Lots of fun. So I'm going to erase this board. We're going to define, I'm going to write down quantitatively what solubility means now. And then we will be able to do several types of calculations. Um, where we can either calculate, if we know the solubility of a solid, we measure how many grams can dissolve in one liter, we will be able to calculate the KSP experimentally. Or vice versa, um, if we know the KSP, we look up in the table, these are the third thermodynamic, hopefully the thermodynamic ones using activities, but we'll just be using molarities and ignoring the activities for lecture. But in our lab, we will be doing both KSP concentration base using molarities and KSP thermodynamic using activities. But we will be able to use that KSP value in an ice table to actually theoretically calculate the solubility of these solids. And if I had one liter of water, how much would dissolve? Of course, that's temperature dependent from one of the earlier chapters. So let me pop this solubility up on the board. All right, for solubility, we are going, we're going to just say, hey, quantitatively, how much solid can dissolve in some set amount of water? Again, typically one liter. And we're assuming, you know, deionized water. It's also temperature dependent, but we're going to look at temperature dependency more when we get to the thermodynamics chapter. Um, but just remember from one of our earlier chapters is you heat up a uh, solution, um, the solid dissolves more. It's opposite for gas solutes, but you can dissolve more solid as you heat it up. And you can review, I think it was chapter 13 for us on solutions. So, so we're not going to look at temperature dependency in this chapter. We will do that later. Um, all right, so two ways we can look at the amount of solute, at least for this class. Either the moles of that solute, which is pretty generic, or the grams of that solute, which is more what you'll see listed in a table somewhere. They'll say, hey, when somebody says, what's the solubility of, you know, zinc phosphate? The assumption will be grams per liter, right? How many grams I can dissolve in one liter of water. 
but sometimes we're going to be using the molar solubility. So, so if, I, if I want the molar solubility, I will ask molar solubility. If I just want the grams per liter, the, the generic solubility, I will say solubility. So always assume grams per liter whenever solubility is mentioned, unless it specifically says molar solubility. We good on that one? We're clear? But we'll find this molar solubility quite useful when we do ice tables because that's moles per liter, moles of solute per liter solution. That's molarity. That's the stuff we get from the ice table. Like, what's X? Right? A lot of times the molar solubility will be X or some form of X in our ice tables. And all we have to do to get from molar solubility to regular solubility is if we know the identity of our solid, just multiply by the molar mass. We're just going moles to grams. Right? It's easy peasy. All right, let's look at the, uh, there's really only two types of problems we're going to be looking at in terms of solubility. Let me generically put them on the board up here, and we will do one problem of each. You're going to find, if you know your ice tables well, it's pretty easy. All right, so these are generic ways of looking at just a couple, there's only two ways to do this. You can go this way or that way, this way, no, that way. You got to figure out which way you're going, and once you know how to solve these problems, you know you're going to get one of the two. Right, so know how to do them both. Know how to hit curveballs and fastballs. Practice them. Right? Don't just practice fastballs just like the first type because what if you get a second type on the test? You're like, and it takes you too long to figure it out. So you want to practice all the different types of pitches I can throw at you. That's why you do your homework over and over, practice tests, everything I can, labs, everything I can throw at you so you get a feel for the different kind of pitches I can throw at you on an exam. So when you get to the exam, just like when you go up to bat, you're like, okay, I, 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 I know how to hit any kind of pitch that's coming at me, so I feel confident, right? Tests are a lot about confidence, right? And that comes from practice over and over and over. Here we go. The two types of problems we're going to do. And of course, we're going to do one example of each, but I think I'll do that on another video. So we'll just do the qualitative look on this video and the intro, and then we'll do the quantitative calculations on the next video. Fun. We love it. You're going to find this so easy. Here we go. We can calculate the KSP. So let's say we have some solid, and we know the identity of the solid, and we look up in the KSP table, and we're like, oh, man, I can't find it. And there's a lot on here, but there's a lot more solids than this, right? This is not, this is a big table, but not complete. So like on an exam or a quiz, I could give you some solid that's not on that table. Why would I give you a problem where the answer is there, right? I'm not going to have you solve for a KSP of something on that table because you know the answer ahead of time. So I can find some obscure, weird solid with a KSP that's not on the table. I can give you its solubility. Let's say, you know, hey, one times, you know, or let's say 327 milligrams dissolve uh, in one liter of solution, right? That's its solubility. Given that solubility, we can get back calculate and get the KSP. How are we going to do that? It's a type 2 equilibrium problem. Remember, you want to recognize them. We're only given the solubility, but when you set up the ice table, you'll see that the solubility is the value of X. Kind of like with the weak acids and bases, the pH gives you the value of X, and when you're provided the value of X, that's a type 2 equilibrium problem. So you set up your equilibrium expression, plug in X, solve for KSP. Piece of cake, right? Um, and you'll find it easier than weak acids, weak bases. The other kind of problem is what is the solubility? So here's some solid, known identity, and that's one that will be on here, right? It will be on your KSP table because I want you to look up that KSP value on that table. That's going to be known, provided the KSP, usually from a table. And if it's not on that table, I will give that to you in the problem if some solid's not on there. So you've got the KSP, just like a KA or a KB, that's a type 3 equilibrium problem. You have no information on equilibrium concentrations, whereas you do in this first kind of problem. So we set up our ice table, right? Do your Q versus, Q versus K, solve for X from the ice table, and you're going to see when we do this problem, X is related to the solubility, if not the solubility on the dot, right? Um, and once you have the solubility, that would be in moles per liter because you're dealing with molarities in the ice table. Um, if you want the molar solubility, you're done. You solve for X and you're done. Make sure you test any assumptions, but you'll find out when we do this, you don't have to make assumptions. Ha, 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 it's pretty cool. Uh, and if I ask for the regular solubility, just take your molar solubility, multiply by the molar mass of your solid. Boom, you've got it. These are going to be fun problems. I'll do it in the next video, though. So we have two shorter videos.